Urzinja Sumsi reacts on this is true reason why Russia started war in Ukraine finally revealed. Again, by the channel of the military show. I know there are people who don't like me watching this because they think this channel is biased, and yeah, I, I kind of can't see that. But the uh, only thing I can say is that like, it's clickbaity title at best, right? When it comes to information, I haven't found something that's like point blank wrong or like too exaggerated. There's gonna be bias everywhere. I don't know. I'm, I'm, there are people who like suggested me to watch some other channels as well, but th those are like an hour plus documentary st size videos. I'm like, I, I can barely do <laughs> this type of way. So I don't know. But yeah, I don't know. Comment down if you think there's a better video or something that you want me to react to. And even if it's big, I guess I'll get to it or something. But yeah, let's always one. This is like, this channel is great. I think it's like real life lore, but like ongoing military element of type of way. I don't know. But yeah, let's always one. I'm pretty sure real life lore also made a video, but it's also like a near hour long. So I, I haven't done it. I guess I'll do it. I don't know. But yeah, let's always one. Remember, if you like more action, don't forget to subscribe. That way, you can really help out this channel by helping the algorithm and things. And that way, I'll know what type of videos to react to more. Like, I'm always conflicted what type of reactions to do or something, right? Uh, you know, I've, I've watched many different genres of videos. Like, ongoing conflict is one of them. There's historical videos, right? Epic History TV and many other channels like that. Uh, Fair Trishan, obviously. And uh, video game videos, like uh, science videos. I love science. I'm a big science guy, as some of you already know. I just posted was oh, like uh, uh, science video, like uh, you know the Samurai style channel, good ones. I forgot the name of that, but yeah, that one which was awesome, right? Uh, the, the whole uh, you know terrifying things about space, which was really great. Whenever there's a space video, I love it. But yeah, there's many different type of videos I do. So if you really like reactions like this, you know, uh, definitely like, comment, whatever. And yeah, let's waste one. Praying in February 2022. There must have been a very compelling reason because it has paid a staggering price over the past two and a half years. The war that was supposed to be over in a few days has instead turned into a prolonged conflict with still no end in sight. As of the summer 2024, American sources estimate Russian casualties to be 350,000. British sources put the number even higher at 500,000, and those casualties are mounting. Yeah, you need to remember casualty doesn't mean deaths. Casualty means anything out of action. So even injured are part of, I'm, I'm f hoping most of those are like injured. The war is fucked up, regardless of the borders and things, right? And I saw the video from this channel, right? How like conscripts, like, you know, uh, how they are treated, right? Uh, which is fucked up, they're human beings, right? Russia themselves treats really badly that, you know, what, what are they called? I forgot, like conscripts, basically, right? During the war times, uh, which is kind of fucked up. There's some kind of a law or something. I really, I'm really forgetting, but yeah, something like that, where they're like treated really poorly, like they're, they, sometimes they don't even get paid or some shit like that, uh, which is insane to me. Like, that's your own people. Like, why would you do that? But yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just horrible. So I'm hoping that's like injured list and not 90 plus percent are just injured and not really dead because that's just fucked up. In May alone, Russia was losing an estimated 1,000 men per day, according to Western intelligence analysis. For now, Russia is replacing these lost men with recruitment numbers ranging between 25,000 and 30,000 per month. The material losses, though, are not so easily replaceable. As of mid-July 2024... Oh, that is so fucked up. They're replacing 1,000 men a day, 30,000 a month, so yeah. So that's how many people are getting injured and dying that so they have to, like, replace, like... Humans are resources now, like, oh, just replace them. Like, I, I don't know. I, the war is fucked up, man. I, I don't know how to, like, you can't make sense of the war. There was a video from Task and Purpose, like, where he talks about, like, how he saw somebody die and what was the experience. Unless you witness that, doesn't matter how hard you try, you can't really imagine that or feel it. You can try to come close to it, like how you'd have felt really process it, but you really don't know type of way. What is something like that? We can sit here and watch all this, but what is just fucked up? Well, Russia has lost at least 3,219 tanks, 9,702 other vehicles, 283 command and control centers, 1,164 tube artillery pieces, 390 MLRS systems, 259 surface-to-air missile systems, 119 aircraft, 138 helicopters, 76 radar systems, and 83 electronic warfare platforms. It's seen the devastation of its Black Sea fleet, with 26 vessels lost. 
It's also seen its Even the economy flags, shackled right? by the most extensive sanctions regime on Earth, more than Iran and North Korea combined. The result has been the- Oh my god, that puts into perspective. More than North Korea and Iran combined. Basically, they're back to Soviet Union times, or Iron Curtain might as well be, because nobody's doing business, basically. Close to it type of way, right? I'm sure like India and like uh, places like that is like buying oil or something. I guess that's, that's the only thing that's happening. So right now it's like Iran, North Korea, which is supplying them like weapons, China too, right? China supplying a weapon or not? I don't know. And countries like India, China basically buying oil and so it's mostly like that, right? Like Soviet times, Iron Curtain type shit. That is insane. But they're becoming wartime economy. So all those numbers are really, you know, like big. All the things they lost, tanks and things. But like they might, they might be able to just like ramp that up, right? In a few years. That's the thing, like how how much resources they have like how faster they can ramp up the production and can they just make up for it like if they can just replace shit that's just like terrifying right like if they can just go into wartime economy and just like build shit left and right the loss of much of russia's geopolitical autonomy as it finds itself more dependent on china Economically, American sources estimate that the war has cost Russia over one trillion dollars. What? These losses raise the question, what could possibly be worth such a price? Why one was Putin trillion. willing to pay it? In this video, we'll do a little detective work to uncover what really might have motivated him to launch his war of aggression at the moment he did. Since Russia is a dictatorship, Putin's opinion is the only one that matters, so we will first need to look at his worldview. Informed opinion believes he is fundamentally a Russian revanchist. There is good reason to believe this. As early as 2005, Putin hinted about these ideological tendencies when he remarked that the fall of the Soviet Union was one of the worst tragedies of the 20th century. In Munich two years later, Putin stunned world leaders with a lengthy tirade against the post-Cold War international order, claiming that it was the construction of the United States that aspired to be the world's sole master. He called this pernicious, revealing that this version of a world order was not something Russia wanted to be a constructive partner in. The following year, NATO issued the Bucharest Declaration, which agreed on the principle that Ukraine and Georgia would join the alliance. There were no specific timetables or roadmaps for them to reach that end, however, and this was a compromise between the United States, which wanted to admit both countries, and France and Germany, which feared the move would antagonize Russia. Putin was in fact in Bucharest what? at the time. France? One thing I've noticed is that France has been really aggressive, especially the president, right? So it's surprising me that France is the one didn't want to do that. Because all the talk about like France has been just point blank, like we might even put like soldiers out there, like screw it, that like we've had it enough type of, that's, that's, I'm, I'm generalizing what the, you know, overall feel of it was, like how he, the president was saying. So I'm surprised he was the one, like France is the one who's saying like, maybe let's not put Ukraine into NATO. Because France has been the most aggressive one yet, right now, right? Because I don't know, like, they fear, like, if this expands, France, France and Germany is basically going to be one of the first countries to properly get hit. That's how it happens, right? Uh, that, that's how Europe is. Wars start and just, like, just countries are so close together. You, if Ukraine falls, Germany is just there. Poland, Germany, and France. And it's very quickly the war starts, right? So I understand like they're aggression, right? Like uh, we have to do something now, now type of way. But it also surprised me they are the one who's like, okay, let's not put Ukraine to NATO because that might escalate thing. I'm guessing that was the case before. Now their answer might be different. Time and tried to lobby NATO's leaders to not permit the two countries to join the alliance. These facts raise the question, did Putin invade Ukraine in February 2022, as is so often believed, primarily because he did not want his neighbor to join NATO. Putin's actions after the Bucharest Declaration would seem to suggest this idea. Mere months after it was published, he resorted to force where his words had failed. Russia invaded Georgia, taking advantage of NATO's own rules. The alliance does not allow members with ongoing territorial disputes to join. Putin's invasion of Georgia, which resulted in the creation of the mostly unrecognized breakaway territories of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, which are propped up through an ongoing Russian military presence, ensured that the country would have the territorial disputes for NATO to refuse its entry. Ukraine, meanwhile, was under a succession of either ineffective or pro-Russian leaders that were unlikely to follow through with joining NATO, but the Ukrainian people were not pleased with what they got. In November 2013, Ukrainians rose in revolt when they- mm, Okay, so he was talking about way before, like I got confused there. He was talking about 2012, 2013. Then France and Germany is like, okay, let's not do it. But that, then it makes sense because right now France is really aggressive. They have a Swiss Germany, I'm guessing. 
what is German aggression is like? Right now, France is like going to be aggressive. We'll speak. Germany is not going to be that, right? Uh, but I'm guessing the feeling is the same. But yeah, back then, this was started in like 2014, right? Uh, with the Crimea thing, in a way. And if the whole reason behind that is like Ukraine kind of joining NATO, then it's like you should have seen that coming, right? Like if, if, the, if, if this was the reason, like why, why have a need to join NATO, right? Because if Ukraine never said like we're going to join NATO, what if Russia never attacked uh, Ukraine, right? Because 2014 is the Crimean thing. This is before that. And like he said, like if, if the country is under conflict, like at, under attack or wartime, you can't really join NATO or something, something like that. So what if Russia's whole reasoning was to do that? Like, let's just attack this so they can join NATO. Because apparently they're so paranoid of NATO, uh, that they don't want NATO to literally touch their border. If that's the case, like, politicians, that's their whole job. Should have seen that coming. Should have stopped this. So, you know, uh, future wars can be prevented. So this is failure of diplomacy, in a way. Uh, then President Viktor Yanukovych rejected an agreement that would orient Ukraine closer to the European Union. Instead, he favored one which would strengthen Ukraine's economic ties with Russia. Since the Russian economy doesn't produce much in the way of things that people want beyond oil and natural gas, this was naturally unpopular with the Ukrainian people. Remember this because it will be important later. Ah. The subsequent Euromaidan protests peaked with the February 2014 Revolution of Dignity, which ousted Yanukovych's pro-Russia regime. Putin now pulled a page out of his 2008 playbook and supported separatist elements in Ukraine's eastern Donbass region, which has many ethnic Russians and Russian-speaking people. With Moscow's support, the separatists established the unrecognized Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. Meanwhile, Putin mobilized his little green men and annexed Crimea, a move he later justified with a shambolic referendum. However, Putin did not go further than this, and the 2015 Minsk agreements resulted in a general ceasefire along these lines, although sporadic fighting continued. For the West, the Minsk agreements were tolerable but disappointing. However, for Putin, the Minsk agreements were something of a success. He seemed content with this new status quo, laughing off the limited sanctions that resulted from the unrecognized annexation of Crimea. Putin trotted the annexation out to the Russian public as his most significant foreign policy achievement. He strengthened his control of the peninsula with new military bases and a bridge of Foreign policy achievement. You invaded a place, took over it. How is that foreign policy achievement? That's not a diplomatic win. Usually any politician, president, prime minister boast about something is usually political. You, you military-wise military took over a place, right? Annexed something, that's... Okay. But yeah, and I'm guessing like they had some kind of like a referendum there just to prove like, see, we were right. I'm pretty sure like they basically said uh, during this current invasion, like they're trying to protect Russians in Ukraine or something. Was it like pro-Nazis or something, neo-Nazis? I don't even know what the reasoning is. Like what neo-Nazis in Ukraine? Like how does that even work? Right, so I guess people will find excuses where they can find type of way, I don't know. See, I think Russia probably thought that they're going to use these excuses, invade Ukraine. It will be over fast before anybody can do anything. And basically, they can come to some kind of agreement with US and NATO involved, and everybody will be happy type of way. Not Ukraine, but everybody else will be happy because everybody had reached agreement. He didn't realize that this is going to stretch on long. And if it's going to stretch on long, US and other countries are going to put sanctions at a whole other level, which happened, right? So they're basically in uncharted territory. They probably didn't see any of this coming. And they're trying to, like, uh, navigate through this right now. Across the Kerch Strait that connected it to the Russian mainland. He also succeeded in doing to Ukraine what he had done to Georgia in 2008. By creating new territorial and ethnic disputes in Ukraine, he effectively prevented it from joining NATO. This would suggest that NATO expansion and the prospect of Kyiv's entry into the alliance was not the major reason why Putin decided to launch a full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. NATO's eastward expansion clearly annoyed him, and his suggestion that any peace terms for the current war must include a guarantee that Ukraine never join the alliance shows that this is an object of importance to him. But it does not answer the critical question, why did Putin wait until 2022, eight years yeah. after his initial intervention in Ukraine? Yeah, man, that's so true. I did not thought of that. Okay, let's, like I said, like I gave, gave a whole speech about like failure of diplomacy, but if that's the case, why did he wait 2014 to 2022, right? Let's say 2020 because COVID did. Who's going to do anything in COVID? But wait a minute. During the COVID time, wouldn't it be worse? Like, yeah, it would be worse for Russians as well. So why would he attack? So 
why did he wait eight years to like attack Ukraine now? So it can't be the NATO thing, right? Because why wait eight, out, eight years then? And clearly they didn't prepare for it. As we can see, like, you know, a lot of things are unchecked. Uh, the, a lot of the tanks were not in working condition already. They could have, you know, like prepared for all that. Could have checked if they're working condition or not. They had eight years. So, so th this was spontaneous in a way. Like they kind of did that very quickly. They probably weren't planning for this in 2014 or something. So it can be just the NATO thing, right? Because I, in my mind, as soon as I heard about that first post, I'm like, you know, joining NATO is the reason. It's just like, my mind is like, okay, that's probably the reason. But this puts doubt on it, like, can be the NATO thing, because they waited eight years. To invade, NATO expansion was likely not the answer. So what else might be? Putin's aforementioned revanchist ideology appeared to be a big reason for the invasion. In July 2021, he released an essay entitled On the Historical Unity of Russians and Ukrainians. In this document, he insisted that Ukrainians and Russians were one people, a single whole. He claimed that Ukraine's post-maiden regime was denying this historical reality and even encouraging neo-Nazi elements in its attempts to do so. This document was one of the clues that the American intelligence community used to determine that Russia's substantial military buildup on the border that year was likely to lead to an invasion and was not part of an exercise. Putin continued to advertise his revanchist ideology as 2021 came to a close. In December, he said that the end of the Soviet Union was the end of the historical Russia that had taken a millennium to create, and a humanitarian tragedy that cut off 25 million ethnic Russians in the new post-Soviet states from their homeland. These comments revealed a motivation that extended beyond preventing Ukraine from joining NATO. The end of the Soviet Union was a major setback to Russia's traditional foreign policy, which calls for the acquisition of naturally defensible frontiers, because Russia sits on the broadest expanse of the Union. And Ukraine is like a, one of the major Soviet places who made a lot of things, right? Like a, a lot of airplanes, MiGs and this and that, like a lot of Soviet things that were made were kind of made in Ukraine which basically when like Ukraine become its own country was left behind in Ukraine, right? So the strategic thing for him as well, like if he takes over Ukraine, he could, you could have that Soviet style element to that. Like now you can use Ukraine and Ukrainian expertise and make a lot of shit, right? European plane, this is a difficult objective to achieve. It's the reason for Russia's rapid expansion across the Eurasian landmass, beginning in the reign of Ivan the Terrible in the 16th century. Russia's influence peaked during the Cold War, when the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact satellite states stretched far west into the European plain and deep into Central Asia. These territorial and geopolitical gains were lost following the Soviet Union's collapse. As a result, Russia had a- The Soviet Union was insane, the landmass of it, right? Like how long it was and how many countries it touched. Even Russia today is like ridiculously long, like North Korea, China. Alaska is basically touching Alaska as well. A lot, lot of European countries. It basically touches a more of most of places, right? Uh, you know, Kazakhstan and places like that, right? So it stretched out a lot. The long border stretching from the Arctic and Baltic to the Black Sea on a broad plain that could not be defended. It was a reversal of the situation that prevailed in the Cold War. Putin deciding to invade Ukraine was partially an attempt to recover the pre-1991 borders, which were shorter and easier to defend. This would seem to suggest a strong geopolitical motive for the invasion, although this also complements the ideological one. As he mentioned in July and December 2021, Putin also lamented the diaspora of Russian culture that came with the Soviet Union's collapse. Putin believed- So what is that building? He constantly shows that building with that logo on it, like, it looks like a ruin. What is that building? ...believes in the so-called civilization state model of the world, where national borders are less relevant than historical, cultural, and linguistic ties which might transcend those borders. This is one of the reasons why he argued that Ukraine's post-maiden government was denying their country's past. Even though most historians rejected his essay's claims as ahistorical, Putin likely believes them. The essay and its assertion that a Ukrainian government yeah, under defa- Yeah, Putin's, uh, there's been, uh, Putin basically said that Soviet Union's fall was like the biggest tragedy that could have been. I'm pretty sure he quoted that. And he follows a lot of Soviet uh, books and things. He really loves them. So it's not that hard to like paint the picture of like what Putin thinks of what Soviet Union was, what are the current affairs. So yeah, him, him wanted to like uh, restore the Soviet Union borders kind of makes sense when you think about how he's thinking, right? So it would make sense. And like Ukraine was like a major part of Soviet Union, right? Like, uh, like I said, a lot of military industrial complex, it was a big part of that. 
So there is like strategic element there as well. Like if, if you can get Ukraine, you can get a lot of things like that. So it kind of makes sense. So it's not just about NATO, is it? De facto Western control was oppressing people of Russian linguistic and cultural heritage was, for his purposes, an ideological justification to invade Ukraine. Even if he does not believe these claims, they at least provide a convenient pretext for him to justify the invasion to the Russian people and the hardships they suffered as a result of the sanctions and the loss of loved ones to warfare. There may also be demographic reasons for Russia to have invaded Ukraine. In March 2023, the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for Putin for the unlawful deportation and transfer of children from the Russian-occupied Ukrainian territories. As a result, all states that participate in the ICC Children? What the fuck? Why? Was that children? What was that? Somebody commented, like, in DJ. What was that about? He took a lot of children from Ukraine into Russia? Why? See, relation will drop to one. So everyone will give birth to one baby and 1.8 of a baby. There you go. I know how statistics work. Chill out. 112 million. Its current average age is 40. This will grow dramatically in the coming decades. An older population will mean recruitment problems for Russia's military and a much greater share of national resources spent on elder care. The forced deportation of Ukrainian children and other Ukrainian citizens can therefore be seen as a way to reverse Russia's population decline and stave off the ballooning average age. Putin's invasion may be as much about reclaiming I mean, the Soviet you, population well, base as it is about- You need young people so you took Ukrainian children. Like, how, what does it- I can't even understand this. Like, what? I don't know, man. Like that. Make immigration lucrative or something so people from abroad, like really poor countries, can come to Russia and like work or something. I don't know. But this is like, okay. I don't know. To me, that feels weird. I don't think that. Is that the case? Is that why he took the children? So, like, okay, now Russia has more younger people. That's just weird. About restoring the Soviet borders. Ukraine, like many post Soviet countries, is in a population decline of its own with a fertility rate of only 1.826 births per woman. However, transferring Ukraine's young same. population is one way to delay the problems that will come to Russia. Perhaps Putin thinks it will buy him time to more seriously reverse the population decline in Russia's homeland. However, there is a critical problem with all three of these interpretations. The ideological, geopolitical, and demographic reasons are all likely important to Putin, but they still do not tell us why he decided to invade Ukraine in February 2022. If these reasons were truly compelling, he would have had a much bigger advantage if he decided to launch the invasion in 2014 when the trouble... Well, to me, it always felt like as soon as COVID was over, like, this happened, right? Because COVID was in 2020, but, like, it was, like, up and down, up and down. There was also another variant of it that came out. Why was it? Like, was it, did it came out in, like, February or something? I don't know, 2021, 2022, I don't remember. But basically, when, like... Felt like, oh, wait a minute, I think COVID is finally going, right? Things are starting to become normal. That's when the war started. So it could have been the COVID. Like, he was waiting for, like, COVID to properly die down before doing the war thing. It could be that. I don't know. Troubles began. Ukraine's military was unprepared for the events of that year. Putin seized Crimea with ease. Ukrainian forces did not perform adequately in the Donbass war, which is why in 2022, then-German Chancellor Angela Merkel described the Minsk agreements as an effort on her part to buy time for Ukraine to strengthen its military. This history and Russia's supposed modernization efforts in the years since 2014 lent the United States and its allies the impression that Ukraine would not be able to withstand the Russian onslaught. However, Ukraine performed far better and Russia far worse than anyone expected. Merkel's idea of buying time for Ukraine's military to get stronger paid off. In the intervening years since the Minsk agreements, the Ukrainians received weapons, training, and forged an intelligence partnership with the West, all of which proved devastating to Russian forces on the battlefield. Ukraine's post-maiden government also had time to get stronger and entrench its support among the Ukrainian people, who finally saw progress in cultivating the stronger ties with the West they had wanted for so long. Most of these things were false in 2014 and 15. Ukraine's government was in chaos and its military was unprepared. I was about to say that what if he had invaded in 2015? The result would have been really drastically different, right? By delaying his invasion until 2022, Putin gave Ukraine time to get stronger. Perhaps he feared sanctions and other methods of retaliation back then. And it's true that delay brought Russia more time to store up additional foreign currency reserves to give it more of a cushion. But if the conquest of Ukraine was his goal, he missed his best chance. Why did he really wait? The answer may have to do more with the shift of the global economy that's occurred in the last 10 years. 
As mentioned, Russia is a country that has abundant resources but does not produce much in the way of globally demanded commodities. Its oil and gas industry is by far its most important. The energy sector provided the revenues for 45% of Russia's federal budget and accounted for 54% of the country's exports in 2021. However, there is a spectre on this horizon, the spectre of climate change. Mitigating carbon-induced climate change emerged as a major international policy priority before the war, particularly in the European Union, which had been Russia's biggest energy customer and remains the second largest even now. EU law requires that the bloc reduce carbon emissions by 55% by 2030 and to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. The result has been a shift to develop alternative, carbon-free energy and materials that run on electricity rather than on internal combustion engines or gas power. Perhaps the best example would be the growth of electric cars. This growth has been explosive. In 2017, only 1% of new cars sold around the world were electric. In 2023, it was 18%. The shift to yeah, but then again, the car ratio is much higher as well. Like more people are buying cars than they bought back then. So that 17% is not as big as it would look. But yeah, electric shift is like big. But I don't, I don't know, man. Is that, is that good enough? Like electric shift isn't that big that people don't need like uh, fossil fuels and things. If anything, they've, they still need it. Like it's running out, right? Uh, like all the freight ship and things like that, like that, that shit is not going electric. So I don't know about that, right? And, you know, gas and things like Russia sells a lot of gas to Europe. Like how are you going to make that electric, right? And that, that's mostly, uh, you know, like to, you know, for heat and things during winter times, right? So I don't know. There, there's still customers like India and like other countries as well. Like India can't just go full electric like that, right? India is not that rich. I don't know about that, right? Like, electric can't be the reason. Shift to electric can't be the reason, I don't know. Electric power and carbon-free energy sources poses an existential risk to the Russian economy. The Saudis have also been grappling with this problem, and the result was the launch of a comprehensive attempt to diversify their economy called Saudi Vision 2030. The plan seems to be paying off with non-oil- Is Saudis like, they have like a desert there. I don't know, like invest in like a uh, solar energy, you can do it. Saudis and like Dubai and like uh, these are very few countries who like rely on a lot of like tourism and like uh, fossil fuel and things like that. They are like dictatorship because like what are the kings and things, right? Princes and things. They they basically have that. They can literally dictate like screw it. Put like a tons of like solar panels everywhere. Let's cre let's create uh, you know like a, a renewable energy and let's become the world's first to do that. They can actually do that and shift their whole economy to the future in that way. Right, they can create a lot of like a hydro dam type of uh, energy and things. Uh, the ocean is just there, so th th they can do a lot of things. I'm pretty sure they they're planning to do that. I think solar energy is the best one they can do because of the desert. Right, it's easier. They can have someone like Elon Musk or something to will basically like contract him to do this shit. I don't know. Oil growth accelerating since 2021, being around five percent in 2022 and 23. Russia, however, has no such plan, except for the war itself. Ukraine has valuable minerals that will be in far greater demand as the global economy gradually transitions from fossil fuels to carbon-free and electric power. What, what? Lithium is one of the most important of these, as it's a vital component in the batteries necessary for these new technologies like electric cars to function. Man. Ukraine has large deposits of lithium in its Donetsk Oblast, which Russia partially controls. If Russia can move further west and north from its current lines, it can also reach the significant stores in Ukraine's Kirovorad Oblast. These lithium deposits have been the subject of geopolitical maneuvering before. Whoa. In 2021, the European Union and Ukraine formed a strategic partnership around Ukraine's mineral ores, with lithium particularly on the policymakers' minds. To date, the European Union imports most of its lithium from China, Understandably, Brussels would like to reduce this. Yeah. There's a saying like most of the rare earth are not rare, they're just in China, right? So yeah, China has that advantage. So I don't get it. Like if Russia did that for the lithium, okay, but now you also pissed off everybody, everybody put sanctions on you. Who are you going to sell that to? India? But that's the only country left. You're not going to sell it to China. China already has it. Or maybe they can sell to China and China sell to, can sell to everybody else. I don't know. That. Would that even work? sell to North Korea like do North Koreans care about electric cars or electric things I don't know that can't be the reason that's one like there are like natural gas deposit in Ukraine and Crimea right that could be the reason because doesn't matter how renewable people want to go 
every single uh, natural deposit will get depleted before people fully go to electric. That's, that's the case right now. That's how high demand of energy is out there. This dependency and ensure Beijing cannot entrench itself at the center of this emerging technology. Ukraine is one of the few countries with large lithium reserves, according to estimates up to 10% of the world's reserves, and its proximity to the EU makes its lithium stores very valuable. According to Ulrich Blum, the founder and CEO of the Lithium Institute based in Germany, Europe can get most of what it needs for its energy transition from Ukraine. Putin therefore now exercises leverage over an important European geopolitical priority. When speaking to Germany's DW News, Gracelyn Baskaran, director of the Project on Critical Minerals for the Center for Strategic and International Studies, mentioned that natural resources can prolong conflict and that tapping the lithium and other mineral deposits there could be a vital source of funds for the Russian military in its continued operations, although Putin would need to rebuild the grid that his missiles and drones have devastated so badly, since mining is an energy-intensive activity that can use up to 50% of locally available power. Not to mention it's going to be target from Ukrainians, basically. If you're trying to use Ukrainian uh, minerals to profit your own military, Ukrainians know where that thing is, basically just attack it, right? Basically, that's how it's happening so far. Additionally, the presence of these resources would act as a disincentive for Putin to give up territory in a negotiated settlement to end the war. Russia's control of the minerals would also make it harder for private industry to invest in Ukraine and help with the post-war rebuilding process. The International Energy Agency estimates that demand for lithium alone will triple by the end of the decade and increase by a factor of 10 by 2050. There's another attractive reason for Russia to go after Ukraine's mineral resources. Baskaran mentioned that Russia is still producing minerals like uranium, palladium, and nickel, another important element for a decarbonized economy at the same level as 20. This might be short-sighted though, because battery technology is like one of the oldest, like not much updated technology. Like that's the problem with electric. Batteries are not really good in that way. Like we, you know, the people that are scientists out there really trying to figure out like how to store energy better way like better than lithium ion and things like that. So in 10, 20 years, we might have some different type of technology that stores energy really efficiently than battery does. So lithium might not be necessary then, right? Lithium might be obsolete. So I don't know, right now, battery technology is the most reason, right? Because people are saying like, why, why haven't you like put solar? If you put solar panel in every roof in France, that can supply energy to an entire planet. Just this area of France, this is just like example, right? So you say like, why not put solar panels in Sahara and places like that, right? Where there's a lot of empty space. Yeah, but how are you going to transfer the energy? Battery storage is like really critical. So people are figuring this out. So this might be outdated by then. 2021. However, since the war started, the exploration for new resources has dropped between 60 and 70%. Exploration in Ukraine can help to make up for some of this shortfall. Russia also does China a solid by controlling Ukraine's mineral resources. If Europe must buy lithium, Putin's invasion is forcing it to continue to rely on China, at least in the short term. If he consolidates his conquest, he will have leverage over the EU's ability to meet its decarbonization goals and a backup to reduced demand for Russian fossil fuels. Russia is a resource-rich country, and it has its own supply of these minerals, but Ukraine's mineral wealth between lithium and rare earth reserves might range between 3 and $11 trillion. In effect, tapping this wealth would allow the war to pay for itself. It would also strengthen the strategic partnership with China, which is the dominant player in refining many of those minerals. The Russo-Chinese axis would also therefore exercise significant leverage over Western countries and potentially impede their decarbonization goals. Alternatively, Russia and China could charge exorbitant fees for the use of these materials, knowing how much of a priority carbon neutrality is to so many Western policymakers. Bloom made it clear that for a stable energy transition and a robust European battery industry, a free and democratic Ukraine that has sovereignty over its internationally recognized borders is critical. Bloom mentioned that these deposits were well known from Soviet times, so Putin knew they were available, and his strategy of attacking civilian infrastructure is an attempt to empty the land of its people so that these valuable resources can be tapped with no consequences. Putin's what? deportation of people in eastern Ukraine can also be seen as part of this strategy. Many experts caution that Ukraine's natural resources were not why Putin decided to launch his war of aggression. However, it's hard to dismiss the timing. It's likely not coincidental that Putin decided to invade at the moment when demand for lithium and other decarbonization elements began to surge.
Putin had deep-seated ideological and geostrategic motives for his invasion, but perhaps the new economic reality was the thing that made him decide to go full speed ahead in February 2022. But what do you think? How I think it's all of them. There's no one reason. And I think the rise of China is also the reason, right? Like he said, like China, Russia axis can be really powerful. And the only reason behind that is China is really powerful. People really forget how powerful China is, right? Uh, China has like 18 trillion dollar economy and like they have all the things they need there, all rare earth elements and shit like that. They are in a weird power element, right? And most countries are not. If the West is powerful, US and NATO, China itself is really powerful, right? Geographically as well. And China and Russia together could be a real powerful element. Right. So I think that was one of the reasons like if, if like sanction grows too much, China and Russia together can be like powerful enough in that way. In 2014, 2015, China was powerful, but not powerful as they are today. Nowhere close. Right now they're like uh, element of their own. US always flew really high, like holy shit, like more richer than anything else, like really rich. But nobody else was close like that until China came along, right? US is 28 trillion, China is 18 trillion, and third country is like 4 trillion or something. So it's not even close, right? Germany is the third, I think, if I remember correctly. Four or so trillion. So like, yeah, China in itself, China, Russia, they're probably banking on that. And how China, because of Taiwan, is like really in a way to collide with the USA. USA was like the biggest economical partner to China for a long time but now it's like China's rich enough China's doing their own thing and like Taiwan might be the issue where they uh, have to basically attack USA itself and now would be the time to basically align with Russia everything just aligns in a way so it could be all those elements who knows but yeah alright well uh, if you like my next channel subscribe and I'll see you next time